Welcome to Peak Studio. In this video, we'll give you a tour of what Peak Studio has to offer. It's a software tool set designed to give you access to accurate and sensitive protein identification and quantification tools in an easy to use and intuitive manner. At its core, Peaks provides the ability to identify proteins and peptides from mass spectrometry data using a variety of different methods. The main algorithm included for this is PeaksDB. It is a de novo assisted database search that identifies proteins from MSMS spectra based on a faster protein database. Peaks also provides a spectra library search. This also allows for the identification of proteins, but by using a library of previously identified spectra as a database. If a peptide could not be matched to an entry in the database, de novo sequencing is provided to give the most likely peptide match to a spectrum. If you're interested in a large group of PTMs, Peaks PTM allows you to search many PTMs quickly and accurately. There's also Spider, which gives you the ability to identify peptides accurately, even if they contain single amino acid variants. The relative quantification of proteins across conditions is also an important part of proteomics. Peaks is an excellent tool set for label-free quantification, isobaric labeling, and stable isotope labeling. In this video, I'll walk you through a demo data set produced by our mass spec service lab for identification and quantification. Here is the main interface of Peaks. Up here in the top left, we have what we call the project tree. As you can see, we have six samples loaded into this project. We have three replicates of three different proteomes, all included in one Timstoff run. We have a human proteome, a yeast proteome, and an E. coli proteome. And in the second set of replicates, we have the same three proteomes, but added in different protein concentrations than we would expect in the first set. This is a great way of testing label-free quantification's ability to accurately get an expected ratio. I'll take you through how to set up this project. Before we get started, we need to configure a database. To do that, go up to the Configuration menu and go to Database. From there, you can use the FASTA Format Database drop-down to select the database that you're interested in. In this case, I'm going to use Uniprot Swissprot, and then click Download to start downloading the database. When you click OK, it will start downloading the database from the public site. Keep in mind that the database comes in a .gz format, which is a compressed format, and you'll need to use a program such as 7-zip or any other program that's able to decompress a .gz file to decompress the database. Once you do that, you can then use the Browse button to browse the location of that database. And you can also use the Download buttons beside the Taxonomy options to install taxonomy lists that you can then use to select specific taxa from the full database. Then click Add Update, and the database will be added to your database list. Now that your database is configured, you're ready to get started with your first search. Go up to the top left hand corner and go File, New Project, to start to add your data. You can then give your search a name, and add the data. Select all the raw files holding the shift button and then click open. And then you have some different options to add data to the project. You can use the first button to add each file to a new sample, or you can hold shift to select multiple files, and then use the second button to create a new sample for each file. In this case, since we have six different samples and three replicates in two conditions, we want to add each sample to its own sample in the project. And then you can specify four pieces of information. Just let Peaks know the enzyme digest, in this case trypsin, the instrument, the fragmentation type, and the acquisition mode. Because Peaks now has the ability to analyze both DDA and DIA datasets. Next, continue through to the workflow section. In Peaks, we now have two different possible workflows. You can go the sequence database search route, or you can go the spectral library search route. In this case, because the DDA data, we're going to use the sequence database search. Here you have the data refinement page. In this case, you can usually keep the parameters the same. We tend to just turn on mass correction 
because that provides peaks of the ability to correct to the carbon-12 isotope in the case when the carbon-13 isotope is selected for fragmentation. Another useful option is to turn on associate feature with chimera scans. This gives peaks the ability to find multiple peptides in the case when there's multiple peptides in a single MSMS scan in a DDA dataset. Then continue through to database search. And here you can set the parameters for your search. In this case, it's bringing up the parameters that I used when I last set up a search. If you're setting up a search for the first time, it will bring up some predefined parameters for you. You can go up to the top right hand corner and select the default option. In this case, these precursor mass and fragment error tolerances are good for this Timstoff data. Select the enzyme fragmentation option. In this case, we could just select specified by each sample because we set up trypsin when we loaded in the project. The digest mode allows you to select how many ends of the peptide you allow for miscleavages. Specific will have only fully digested peptides. Semi-specific will allow one end of the peptide to disobey the rule. And unspecific will allow both ends to disobey the rule. No digestion is provided for the case of peptide sequence databases. You can also allow for the number of miscleavages within the peptide, and then set the PTMs. Here, we're only selecting carbamidomethylation and oxidation. You can select up to 10 variable PTMs for a typical database search in order to get it done in a reasonable amount of time. If you're interested in more PTMs, I suggest turning on the Peaks PTM option here. Then you can specify the number of variable PTMs per peptide. For a PeaksDB search, I recommend only using two, three, or four variable PTMs per peptide. If you're interested in more than that, that's another case where you'd want to use Peaks PTM. You can then select the database. In this case, it's bringing up the database that we set up previously, and then you can select your taxa. In this case, you can use the control button to select multiple taxa. In this case, I've selected E. coli, human, and yeast taxa. Down here at the bottom, we have some different general options. You have the option to generate a decoy database using the decoy fusion approach. In this case, it will create a decoy protein database to estimate the likelihood of encountering a false hit. You also turn on Peaks PTM, which will allow you to search for as many variable PTMs as you'd like. You can use the advanced search option here to see how many PTMs are included in the search. By default, it will search the 312 naturally occurring modifications in the Unimod database, or you can search with a preferred set of modifications. And you also have the option here to turn on SPIDER, which allows you to identify single amino acid variants. In this case, we're just going to do a typical database search. You can now continue through to the quantification page. You have some different options here along the left hand side. You can do label free quantification, report grind quantification, which includes eye track at TMT, or you can do precursor ion quantification such as SILAC. This example is a label free quantification example. It will look for similar peptide features, as in the same peptide eluding at the same time across the different mass spec runs in order to line them up and to determine the relative abundance of each across different samples. To do that, we need to specify a mass error tolerance, usually the same error tolerance that you use for the precursor ion for identification, ion mobility tolerance, and you can specify a retention time shift tolerance. In the more recent versions of PEAKS, we have the ability to auto-detect the best retention time shift tolerance for the data set. With these settings, we can then continue on to set up our sample groups. The groups are the conditions in your original experiment. So in this case, samples 1, 2, and 3 have one expected ratio, and samples 4, 5, and 6 have different ratios that we'd expect to see for our three proteomes, remembering that we have three different proteomes in these data sets. We have human, yeast, and E. coli, 
lysates, which have different expected ratios for the different species of proteomes. Then with these settings, we can click the Finish button, and we'll start our search. Once the search is complete, you'll notice some new result nodes up in the top left-hand corner. You'll have de novo sequencing, PeaksDB, and label-free quantification results here. Let's take a look at the PeaksDB results. The first thing that you'll see when you open the result is the false discovery rate curve. You can use this to determine what score cutoff is best for this set of results. Click the FDR button in the top left hand corner and it will give you an interactive view of the FDR curve. You can select some of the predetermined false discovery rates along the right hand side to pick the cutoff that works best for you. In this case, let's use 1%. You have some other filters available up at the top here you have the ability to set an A score or ion intensity filter. This will allow you to set a threshold for the localization of post-translational modifications. Generally speaking, you could set this to 20 or leave it at zero. You can also have the ability to set the cutoff at the protein level. You can use a minus 10 log P cutoff, generally 20 or greater, or you could set a false discovery rate at the protein level. You can also set the number of unique peptides that are required in order to make an identification. Usually you could set that to one or two. Then click apply and these filters will be set for all the results. Once that's done, all the results that you see from that point on will be within the thresholds that you set. Let's take a look at some of the figures here in the summary view. Figure 2A shows you the distribution of target hits in blue to the decoy hits in pink. Here you can see that decoy hits from the decoy database tend to be found with lower minus 10 log p scores. And you can see where the cutoff is made at the 1% false discovery rate cutoff. Over here on the right, you can see a similar distribution, but based on the mass error. You can use this as a guide to see whether or not you're catching the true mass error range of your mass spec experiment. In this case, most of the identifications are within our 20 ppm mass error tolerance range. So this is a good mass error tolerance for this data set. Table one will show you some statistics about how many proteins and peptides were identified in each of the six samples. And as you continue on through, there'll be some other useful statistics that you can use to gauge the quality of your results. But let's take a look at the actual results. You can come here to the protein tab where you can see further details about your protein identifications. This is a completely interactive chart. You can scroll through this list and click on any of the blue bars and it will bring up the best annotated spectrum for that peptide. Where you can use your scroll wheel in the body of the spectrum to scroll up on the y-axis or click and drag with the left mouse button to zoom in on particular parts of the spectrum. The fragment mass error plot on the bottom will also scroll with your selection. Once you've taken a look at your data and you're happy with your results, you can then export it. Go back to the summary view and click the export button and there's some different options to create HTML reports uh, text formats in CSV format that you can then open in programs such as Excel. For third-party exports, such as for Skyline or Pride or Scaffold, which you can then export to other tools, or Spectral Library, which you can then use to create a Spectral Library from your identification data to use for a later Spectral Library search. Click the Export button to begin the export. Now let's take a look at the quantification results. One of the first things that you'll see when you open up your quantification result is a heat map showing the proteins that are upregulated in red across our first three sets of replicates, samples one, two, and three coming from our first set of replicates, or proteins that are less abundant in our second set of replicates, which are shown in green. It's important to note that some of the default filters for our quantification result are set to only show proteins that are significantly changing. 
If you want to see all the proteins in your result, you can click the Edit button here and set the significance cutoff to zero to see everything. We have some different options for the significance method. We suggest you use ANOVA if you have a reasonable number of replicates per condition. Peaks Q is provided in the case that you don't have enough replicates. You also have the option to select whether or not you want to see proteins only above a certain fold change. We can set this to one if we want to see all proteins. Then click OK. Let's take a look at some of the other figures that are seen here. If you scroll through to figure three, you can see the distribution of the peptides in terms of the ratio based on the quality score and the average abundance. Notice how we have three distributions here. This would be our human, our E. coli, and our yeast distributions. You can see based on the quality score and the average abundance that the distribution only becomes visible above a certain quality or average abundance cutoff. So we might want to set these cutoffs in a way to only include peptides where the true distribution is observed. So we can come here to the peptide feature filters and we could set the quality score cutoff. Generally speaking, a quality score cutoff of five or greater is where you limit the variance. And also peptides with a higher average abundance tend to be more reproducible as you can see here in this chart. So let's set this to one E3. And you have some other options here as well. The peptide ID count filter will require that you have an identified version of that peptide in one sample in each of the replicates. So if we set this to one here, it will have to be identified in our first set of replicates and in the second. We can set this to zero if we want to include the possibility of missing peptides. Also, we have the have at least so many confident samples option here, which will require to have an identified which will require to have an, a detectable peptide feature in one sample in each of the replicates as well. Set this to zero to also include the possibility for peptides missing from one condition. Then click OK and we can apply these filters. Once we do this, we have some different options up on the top right hand corner to test the reproducibility of our results. Click the density ratio plot. It will bring up, bring up this plot where you can see the density of the protein ratios. Now we can see that we have three distinct populations of our human, yeast, and E. coli proteins. You can also click the sample correlation button and it'll bring up some options to see some correlation plots. Let's check the reproducibility of our first set of replicates by holding shift and selecting samples one, two, and three. And it will bring up this plot where we can see the reproducibility of our results comparing the different replicates and giving correlation coefficients of each of the results at the protein, peptide, and peptide feature levels. You can also click into the protein tab and see the specific details for the proteins that were quantified. You can sort by the peptides that were quantifiable for each protein and then click the peptides tab to see details of the peptides that were used for this quantification. Here you can see details about how the quantification was performed. As you can see, we use the top three peptides with the highest average area across all samples unless they were identified within the same part of the protein. Double click on one of the peptides and it'll bring up some specific details from that peptide, including the XIC curves. Then again, once you're happy with your results, you can go back to the summary view and export your results for further analysis. Thanks for taking the time to watch this walkthrough of Peak Studio. For more information, please visit our website, bioin4.com.